And the title of my message is, Be Ready, The Fiery Trials Are Coming. Be ready. Some of you say here today, well, Pastor Carter, you're too late. I'm already there. I'm already in the midst of a fiery trial. Well, you'll not be left out. But for those who are not, and if you are a God-fearing, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christian, you can be sure that fiery trials are going to come your way before, unless you get run over immediately after you leave the service today. Fiery trials are coming your way. Father, I thank you, God, with all of my heart for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, without your anointing, I wouldn't even attempt to speak this. Father, I ask for a covering of the Holy Spirit. I ask, O oh God, that there would be a desire in our hearts to hear truth, and to hear truth that can set us free and comfort us and lift us and hold us in the very palm of your hand. Jesus, I am comforted today by the words that you spoke when you said that we are in the Father's hand and nobody, absolutely nobody, can take us out of the Father's hand. Lord, we rest in your safety today, and God, now show us how to appropriate that safety. Show us how to walk in the victory that you have purchased for us on Calvary. Show us what we're to lay hold of by faith and how you've promised to give us the victory through every fiery, difficult trial, especially the ones that people are going to have to go through, perhaps not too very far into the future. And Father, I thank you, God, that you will anoint and set free, and there will be a shout of glory in the house today. In Jesus' name, amen. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Be ready. The fiery trials are coming. First Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. I want to read verse 19 again. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Now, Peter, I'm just going to really paraphrase what's written in the beginning of my study Bible. Peter, the apostle, wrote this letter to encourage the believers to endure the intense persecution that was prevalent in the area. Now, the, the, the churches he wrote to were in Asia Minor, and they were established in various uh, churches throughout, throughout that part of what was then known as the Roman Empire. And he wrote to prepare them for the intense persecution that was prevalent in the area and to prepare them for the difficult times ahead of them. Now, the first empire-wide persecution of Christians did not come until A.D. 249 under the brutal emperor Decius. But local persecutions many times were quite severe. And one in particular took place early in the second century in Bithynia, which was one of the provinces to which Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. A letter was sent from Pliny, governor of Bithynia, to the Roman emperor Tarajan in A.D. 112. Now that would be approximately uh, 50 years after the writing of this epistle. Now he explained that he had been executing people who confessed that they were Christians. Tarajan's reply expressed his approval of Pliny's policy, but instructed him to set free those Christians who would renounce their faith and worship the Roman gods. Since 1 Peter was most likely written in AD 60, in the AD 60s, persecution of the severest kind had yet to come. You see, the Apostle Peter 
inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. We don't know what level of persecution was actually happening to these churches that he wrote to at this particular time. But persecution of the severest type is always preceded by various other steps and levels throughout society. I've actually studied this over the years when I was in college, and I recall when you begin to look at issues like the Holocaust and ethnic cleansing and these types of things that have gone on throughout the world, there are, there are certain steps that will always begin in every society, uh, perhaps a once civilized society, a, a society of people that seem to peacefully coexist one with another, uh, all of a sudden, it seems, will rise up and with the most wicked of uh, devices begin to humiliate, uh, extricate in some cases, and even exterminate uh, people within their own borders. We sit back in horror and say, well, how did this happen? Where did it come from? Beloved, the attitudes that have been formed in the hearts of people prior to uh, getting to this stage of extremism as it is are, are usually formed in the hearts of the, the, the uh, part of that society at least, well before any kind of these types of violent actions begin to happen. Now historically there are steps which occur before any society moves to violence towards others with whom they have formerly and peacefully coexisted. And firstly, they form an inward despising in their hearts for the core values which another group holds to be valid. The society at large rejects certain ways of thinking or certain values which are the things that we hold dear and, and uh, espouse in our hearts to be truth. But another part of society, generally the, what's called the dominant part of society or the majority, uh, begin to reject those values. The Apostle Paul uh, tells Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, he, said, he talks about in the last days, the core values of man will become almost completely anti-Christian. The world is going to go into a deeper and deeper lawlessness, a deeper and deeper darkness, until Jesus Christ comes and takes his church out of the world, and then the world for the last seven years of recorded history will be plunged into a darkness, an inhumanity, man to man, that will literally stagger even the, uh, the, the most... Uh, uh, vivid of imaginations. A, 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 a horror will be unleashed upon the earth of unprecedented proportion. The Apostle Paul says this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That means without family affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, Incontinent. Uh, incontinent means unable to retain anything of any value. Fierce despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And verse 5 talks about there will be a, the majority will cover this all up with a form of religion. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power or denying the power that God gives to, to change. Denying the power thereof, Paul says, from such turn away. To add insult to injury, in effect, there will be, all of these things will be in the hearts of uh, an end time society, and they will cover it all up with a false religion. Cover it all up with the pretense of, of serving or at least giving some kind of a token uh, acknowledgement of God. Beloved, verse 3 tells us that living in the last days are among persons at least to typify the character of those days. Now, we don't know exactly where we are. It is widely speculated that we are living in the last days. Paul considered himself to be living in the last days. And if, if they did back then, then we, much, we are much closer than they were in those days. There is certainly a sense, a feeling inside that things are not the way they used to be. We are rapidly heading towards the time that uh, perhaps the prophet Daniel spoke about, when knowledge shall be increased and men shall run to and fro throughout the world. But living in the last days or at least among persons who have the characteristics of people of the last days, you will be despised just for loving good. All you will have to do to be despised is to be good. Despisers, Paul says, of those that are good. That is, that is of course, good as God sees good. Those who, have, uh, who love the Word of God, uh, who, who want to walk God's way, who believe that God's Word is the truth, 
The Apostle Paul warns that you will be despised as you are living among people who exhibit the characteristics that men will have in the last days. Now, in the Christian context, when a people have been exposed to and with knowledge they have rejected the truth, they will begin to speak evil of the way of God. I, I don't know if there's uh, a nation on the earth more than America that would ever typify this statement. America has been exposed to the gospel. America, in effect, is still exposed to the gospel, at least in some form. Most of the gospel in the media today is perverted. It is not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet there is still, and still are some ministers and ministries that are still preaching the word of God. The majority of Americans today have been exposed to the word of God, but as a society have rejected the very uh, moral fabric as it is, the very social, spiritual fabric of the nation is now being rejected. Christianity is now openly ridiculed. Christians are blasphemed, literally. Uh, I don't listen, I can't listen to it anymore. But I am told that on the airwaves now, there's these shock jocks, as they call them, and, and other type of, uh, of people. They literally, uh, they blaspheme without any care whatsoever. Christ and Christians and Christian truth and anything to do with Christians is spoken evil of today. Made a mockery of and ridiculed. And it, it, is, a, it is a very real warning sign, beloved. Uh, when a society begins to reject its own core values, when a society begins to turn from the very fabric of what it used to be, it's like a Christian who once came to the house of God and turns away and rejects the truth. The Bible says when a, when a man who knew the truth turns and rejects it, he becomes a reprobate. That means his spirit, his mind become open to demonic powers and all forms of evil now begin to form within him. And he begins to call evil good and he begins to call good evil. He begins to call those who represent good evil. And in his heart, oftentimes wishes that they were no longer part of his society. I suppose people like this were at one time in American history marginalized. That means there would be just a, a few. There would be isolated little pocket groups that speak out against the people of God. But I have a trepidation in my heart today because there's a shift in society. And it's no longer the minority, it's, be, it's turning very quickly to the majority of society that are beginning to uh, feel that the ways of God perhaps are too restrictive or old-fashioned or uh, ultimately not the ways of truth and subsequently beginning to speak evil of that way and begin to speak evil of the people of God. Simeon, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple in Luke chapter 2 verse 34, Simeon looked at Jesus and he said, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He is set for a sign that may be spoken against. Beloved, listen to me. Jesus said, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more are they going to call those of his household? We are not going to escape the reproach that's come on the name of our master in our generation and in this society. Jesus Christ must be dealt with. There are other things in life that we can afford and society can afford to embrace or reject and sometimes get away with it. But Jesus Christ is not one of those options. He is the way, he is the truth, he is life. There is no other way to eternal life. There is no other truth that changes and sanctifies. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. He must be dealt with. If not on the earth, he must be dealt with before the judgment throne. But Christ must be dealt with by every man, woman, and child who has ever been born or ever will be born. Beloved, if you hear the message of salvation, you will either yield to God or begin to speak evil of what you have heard. Even those who are in this house today, perhaps visiting and brought here by somebody that thought you needed to hear the word of God. You've come in, you've, you're going to hear, you are hearing now that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You are hearing that Christ came and died on a cross for your sins. You are hearing that there's no other way to eternal life but through him, that he has a legal and lawful claim to every person who's ever been born and by his grace and mercy has offered to forgive and give you eternal life and give you a full and a new life here in this world. And now you've heard it and you have to deal with it one way or the other. 
We either embrace it and say, this is the truth, and I must yield my life to God, or we go our way and begin on a pathway of speaking evil of the ways of God. Acts chapter 19, if you'll go there with me, please. Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul, in verse 8, was in Ephesus. And the scripture says, in verse 8, he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months. That means that there were a people who gave him an audience for three months. Could you imagine listening to Paul for three months? That must have been something else. Paul had in such an in incredible revelation and so willing to give it to the people that the scripture tells us he preached so long one time that a young man fell asleep and, and fell down dead from an upper story window. Paul went and embraced him, raised him back to life and carried on preaching the gospel. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Paul for three months and picture yourself now coming in and hearing Paul and Paul's expounding and he has the knowledge and he can tear those Old Testament scriptures to pieces and show that every line, every paragraph, every comma, every sentence is about Jesus Christ. He can prove it conclusively. He can show people where they must go and how they must live and where eternal life comes from. He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly, it says, for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse or different people or part of the people were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Beloved, you will either yield to God or speak evil eventually of what the truths that you begin to hear. When they became hardened, beloved America has become hardened. People have sat in the house of God for generations now, and we now have a generation that I believe is hardened, but by a miracle of God's grace, are hardened now to the Word of God. Just there for fire insurance, but not there for salvation, not there to live for God, not there to worship Him, not there to serve Him, not there to love Him, but hardened. And when they became hardened, it says in verse 9, they began to speak evil of that way. Began to speak evil of the way, perhaps, of total surrender to the purposes of God. I remember, beloved, when I wanted to yield my life to God as a young police officer, and I wanted to, to give all because God, I felt in my heart God was calling me. He was, I could literally hear his voice calling me to preach the gospel. The hardest, uh, the hardest obstruction that I had to that total yielding to God was getting through the, the, the gauntlet, as it is, of lukewarm Christians that were around me. The number of people that I'm not even, I'm not even aware of somebody that said, that's a good idea, obey God. All around, we're talking about family, they're talking about your career, they're talking about the loss of pension and dental plans, as if that's more important than the kingdom of God. Speaking evil doesn't necessarily mean you're frothing at the mouth and cursing Christ. It, 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 it has the connotation of this, you say, this is, this is not good. This is not good that you should yield your life to God. This is not good that you should, you should become radical as it is for the cause of Jesus Christ. This is not good. Not, in effect, if you're not speaking good about the ways of God, we're speaking evil about the ways of God. In Acts chapter 19 again, verse 23 to 29, these particular scriptures really show us the, the beginning of the final stages of human depravity when the gospel is rejected. Verse 23 is evil speaking. The scripture says that at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. Now look, at, look up just for a moment. There was a stir. And that stir means that people began to talk. They began to talk with one another. They began discussing the things that were said. They began to fear the truth. It's amazing. You can have in our society, you can, there can be mosques being built in every corner in every city. And it, it, it seems nobody is concerned about that. But let one Christian stand up in front of an abortion clinic and it will be on the front pages of major newspapers throughout the, the city. Incredible when you think of it. No small stir about that way. Now that way is the way of Jesus. Because I believe even the most unregenerate have an inward knowledge that there is a God and they are hearing the truth. 
They choose to reject it, but there's an inward knowledge because we are created by God. Paul the Apostle says, the heavens declare his glory. Day and night declares his glory. Everything around us declares his glory. Humanity is without excuse because God has not left himself without witness. Therefore, every man who stands before the throne of Almighty God one day will have no excuse. There will not be one man ever born who can say, God, I never heard and I never knew. The Lord will say, no, you, it was in my word that even the heavens, the, the way the seasons turn, the way the stars are aligned, the way the planets stay in alignment, the way the heavens are held together by the word of God was a living testimony to the fact that I am. Now, in verse 24 to 27, evil speaking will carry on sometimes for a long time. But evil speaking then turns into an irrational fear. And if, if, if you really, it, it's tragic, but if you study the Holocaust, these are exactly the steps that the Holocaust took. An evil speaking about a particular race of people. And when evil speaking carried on long enough, then it began to turn into an irrational fear in the hearts of the people. And we see it here. It says in verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. whom we had called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, we know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now, this, I want you to see the irony in this. There's no small stir. The city comes together. They, they say... Uh, Diana is a great goddess. Uh, she supplies uh, through at least our craft and making statues of her and all of these things. We have our income. The whole, she is magnificent and the whole world worships her. But they are afraid of this one man, Paul. Now, does that tell you something? One man. One man filled with the Spirit of God can tear down the stronghold of ages. One man, one woman, one young person given to the purposes of God. And the plan of God can go forward and what the devil has taken like Jericho hundreds of years to build just by the obedience of one man can come down in a moment of time. And you better believe hell knows it. The devil is aware of it. That's why the devil will fight against you tooth and nail every step of faith you try to take because he knows his kingdom is only a tinsel kingdom and one Christian can bring it down. <laughs> Irrational fear now turns in verse 28 to wrath. It says, when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. The word wrath in the Greek text is thumos, and it means an impetuous move to harm. It started out with evil speaking, and it progressed to an irrational fear. You remember in Europe, in particular, uh, the, 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 in, in World War II, they began to uh, fear that the Jews were going to control the economy. Evil speaking turned to an irrational fear. An irrational fear turns to an impetuous move to harm. That's what the word wrath means. It means an impulsive. All of a sudden, it's like a mob mentality just hits a, a revulsion towards a particular type of people. And the, the society at large says, we don't want this in our borders anymore. You remember when Jesus cast the, the, the uh, uh, devils out of the man in the garden of Gadarenes. They went into the pigs and off into the sea. And the whole city came out and said, get away from us and get out of our coasts. We, we don't want this kind of working among us. An impetuous move to, to, to harm or to, to remove that which they disagree with out of their immediate uh, society. And now in verse 29, it says, The whole city was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius. You see that in these ethnic cleansings that have gone on in Africa and other places and uh, uh, throughout the world and in the Balkans. A confusion. People don't know what they're doing. Sometimes they don't even know what side they're on. It's like a mass insane mentality. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. 
And so we have evil speaking turns to irrational fear, which leads to wrath or an impetuous move to harm by isolating, humiliating, legislating, and in the extreme, eliminating that which society has come to both fear and hate. Now, I don't know at what stage the churches were to whom Peter was writing. I'm not aware. Possibly some of them were at rest. Acts 9.31, after the conversion of Paul, for example, says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and were multiplied. Or, it's possible that they were experiencing, in some cases, at least, the beginning of what would eventually become both widespread and severe. There, there seems to be very strong evidence, if you study the entire book of <clears throat> First Peter in this context, that there was a rise of evil speaking in, against the Christians in that part of the world. It had not yet... There's no evidence, at least in the writings of 1 Peter, that it had, it had, it had blown into uh, an out-and-out -out overt persecution, but there was a, a, a widespread intolerance among the people towards those that were professing the name of Jesus Christ. There, there are times, beloved, when Christianity is in season, and that there are times when it's out of season in society. That's why the, the gospel says we're to be ready in season and out of season. There are times when a Christian can, it can be popular to be a Christian, but I feel in my heart that that time is over for anybody living in North America. Now, it, I want to show you some of the evidences of what Peter is speaking about that was beginning to happen. And I believe that many of you are going to be able to identify with this because I know like I know like I know that the Holy Spirit has put this word on my heart today. Peter says in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 12, or 1 Peter, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 12, he says, having your conversation. Now, this is, I'm going to be going all through the book of 1 Peter, but I, I just want to lay a foundation of what was really going on, where, where I feel, at least personally, that they were at in, in this uh, situation of intolerance that was eventually going to lead to imprisonment and in some cases even death. He says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereby, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, I feel that Peter is, is saying, he's addressing what really was the issue. Uh, perhaps, perhaps people who had been accepted, at least momentarily, in certain parts of the world, now that society was beginning to speak against uh, the Christians. They were being spoken against as if they had some kind of an evil motive in their heart. Again, chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Paul says, having a good conscience, that, again he says, whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now, the, the, the Greek word for evildoers in verse 16 is someone who is injurious to the community. And, and Peter, is saying, Peter is saying to the people, that they are speaking against you now as if your presence is harmful to the community. As if perhaps what you are, uh, as always is the case with Christianity, what you are speaking is restricting or at least bringing pangs of conscience, perhaps, what they would like to do and, and what they would like the normative value, as it is, of society to be. You see, the, 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 the pro-abortion uh, movement, for example, in America, would like everybody to agree that it's more expedient, it's, it's better for all of society, especially a society that is bent on selfishness, that should we just, instead of having to endure the consequences of uh, bearing children, that we should just eliminate them. Uh, you know, beloved, that is wicked. That is absolutely wicked. There's, there's, and and, and you, you see the voices raised against that are being uh, portrayed even in the media as radical, as uh, overbearing and dominant and trying to take away freedoms and rights of people. And, and we see Peter saying, whereas they, they speak of you as someone who is, whose presence is injurious to the community. He said, have a good conscience so that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation 
in Christ. Now this is evidence that the evil speaking had already begun. And again, in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul says it this way, or Peter rather, he says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked, when we walked in lasciviousness and lusts, excess of wine, and revelings, and banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Now, Peter's just describing what you and I were before we came to Christ. He's describing Manhattan, folks. He's describing Times Square right here. For they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excessive riot, speaking evil of you. Now, the word that is used here in verse 4, speaking evil, is blasphemio, which really we get the word blaspheming God, but it means spoken against to hurt their reputation. Now, folks, I know that some of you are living it right now in the places where you are working. I know you're living it. I know that many of you here this afternoon are living it. You all of a sudden, you're going to work. You love God. You're going to church. You got saved. And all of a sudden, there are people that are spreading rumors about you. They are speaking. Uh, it started with a snicker, perhaps. Uh, some people I've spoken to recently have noticed the progression. Years ago, or several years back, it started with a snicker. And a snicker to, turned to like a seething anger. And the seething anger turned to a false accusations about your work ethic or your life or your motives or intentions. And then all of a sudden it turns uh, against, the speaking turns into something that is designed to hurt your reputation. And then after that it is moving to push you out even of the workplace creating lies about you. I've, the number of Christians I've spoken about in this body that have been brought before as it is kangaroo tribunals in their workplaces, having to face false charges and false accusations, and all they have wanted to do is live for God and live an honest life and be a good uh, working person in their, uh, in, in, their, in their place of employment, and all of a sudden they, they're, they're, uh, they're standing before th this, this unbelievable uh, accusing group of people that are spouting these false motives, uh, attributing false motives to their heart, to their life, to their words, trying to catch them in everything they say. And ultimately, really what it boils down to is somewhere along the line, they shared Jesus with somebody normally in that office. I had a, a lady come to me who was uh, working for a, uh, a large, fairly large corporation. And uh, in that corporation, uh, bills are being sent out to the general public. And there were a lot of different people working through a, a, a smaller secretarial pool. And uh, I remember when she came to me, she said, Pastor, they were sending all of them, all of them. Now, these are professional people here in New York City, and they're sending up fraudulent bills for services that have never been rendered. And when I brought it to the attention of some of the other people involved, they said, well, everybody does it. Everybody Everybody is doing this. It's only st stealing, in effect, from the government, so it's not stealing at all. They steal from us. And of course, you know, thieves will always justify what they do. And I remember she said, well, well I can't do this anymore. And beloved, you would, you would, you would find it hard-pressed to understand the, the persecution that she came. They wouldn't fire her because she had the goods to turn them in and, and launch an investigation. And I know they didn't because they were afraid, but they, they launched a massive character assassination against this, this wonderful Christian lady who simply just wanted to live for God and do what is right. We live in a horribly evil society today, folks. I don't think we even understand the, the, the beginnings of what's going on, the perversion that's gotten into the hearts of so many people today, even many who are called by the name of Christ. I had a lady in my office just this week who's lost... Uh, a, a, a significant amount of weight. I was quite shocked at the weight that she's lost. And I said, what's the matter with you? And she said, I've developed stomach ulcers or stomach trouble because of my job. They are doing everything in their power to get me fired. They're lying against me and they're doing this and they're doing that all because I, I live for God, because I want to do things God's way. And they're standing against me and they're slandering me. Oh, beloved, I'm telling you, these are the steps of fiery trial. These are fiery trials. We have many in our body here right now at Times Square Church that are going through these fiery trials. Oh, beloved, I want to encourage you to hold on because the harder it gets out there, the sweeter it's going to be in the house of God. 
the harder it gets out there, the more you're going to appreciate that brother, that sister that's sitting next to you. You're not going to care what color they are. You're not going to care what country they come from. You're not going to care how much money they make. You're just going to be so glad. And many of you are like that right now. You're just so glad to come into the house of God. So glad that somebody finally reaches out and they're not accusing you, but they're loving you. Oh, beloved, we're going to learn the value of encouraging one another in Christ and speaking words of life into one another. As the whole world tries to destroy that which is Christ, we begin to understand that we are a body. God has brought us together, and we are to exhort one another daily. We are to provoke one another to love and to good works. We are encouraged to encourage one another to believe God that through the most severe of trial, we will not be burned when we go through the fire. We will not be overwhelmed by the flesh that comes around us. We are, to our, we are to open the Word of God and speak as the oracles of God into one another's lives and encourage one another and even more so as the day approaches. Hallelujah! 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 I look forward to the fellowship, beloved. I look forward to the sweetness of fellowship in the house of God. And that's one thing that persecution will do. Finally identifies who belongs to God and who does not. Finally allows us to come together and appreciate one another the way God has designed us to appreciate one another. To reach out in genuineness with an unfeigned love for the brethren and say, I love you and I'm praying for you and I'm believing God that you're going to be victorious in your situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Apostle Peter, it, it, by the standards of much of what you hear preached today, if they were to write the scriptures, they'd say, stand up and fight for your rights and go to some this and, and, and declare uh, your rights for this and your rights for that. But what does Peter tell us to do? In chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire, fiery trial which is to try you, though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice. Rejoice, he said, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad also with exceeding joy. If, he said in verse 14, you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Now why should I be happy if I'm being reproached? Oh, folks, this is a hard thing to do. You know, I've, I've been through some of these things, and i can, got to confess, I've gone through some seasons where I'm not very happy. I was not a good example of verse 14. But I didn't know why I should be happy. Peter says, listen, happy are ye? Here's why. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This is why you should be happy. Hallelujah. The spirit of glory. In other words, Jesus is seen in you. The Spirit of God is upon you. The glory of God. It's not you they hate. It's Jesus they hate. Hallelujah. And Peter's saying you should be happy because when you are persecuted like this in a secular world, it means that the unsaved person sees Jesus on you, sees Jesus in your life. If you were like they are, they would speak well of you. Woe unto you, Jesus said, when all men speak well of you, so did their fathers to the false prophets. Hallelujah. In this world you shall have tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's going to fade away, but you're not going to fade away. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, when they speak evil against you for my name's sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Isn't that an amazing thing? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Folks, when you get home at the end of the day, if your whole office has been slandering you because you've been living for God, whether you have a roommate in, in your apartment or you go home to your wife or go home to your husband, say, they have been speaking evil against me all day. Let's take a moment out and let's rejoice and thank God for his goodness. Thank God for his presence. Thank God that they see Jesus in me. Thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing that song, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Now, verse 15, chapter 4, he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Remember, he said in John, if any man hates his brother, he's a murderer. 
or as a thief or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, Peter's saying basically, don't suffer by responding in like spirit to those who despise you because of Christ in your life. Well, you can suffer, but it's not necessarily righteous suffering. You can suffer just because you're lashing back and you are, you are exhibiting in effect the same spirit as the world. Now, I'm not saying that you don't appeal your situation if there's a process to do that. I'm not saying that you don't stand and lovingly speak the truth. But what the Bible is saying is don't go and respond in like spirit because you will suffer, but it's got nothing to do with suffering for righteousness. And again in verse 16, he said, Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And Peter's saying, you haven't been triumphed over. Don't feel defeated. Let me show you now how this, how through this God will protect you. I want to show you now how God will protect you and be glorified. Now go to chapter 1. Let's do it real quickly. I want to get through this in 10 minutes. Chapter 1. This is how God's going to protect you. <clears throat> he says, wherefore, verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fastening yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges, every man's, uh, judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now, Peter is just saying, first of all, gird up the loins of your mind. Get into the Word of God. Begin to learn what God says about the situation. And when you have the Word of God in your heart and you're meditating on the Word of God, when you are opposed by, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, spiritually violent people, that's, I guess, the only way I can describe it, the, let the Word of God come and, and gird up your mind. As a soldier would gird himself up and prepare for battle, know the Word of God. Know what God says about you and about your situation. Have the Scripture ready that comes up and, uh, for example, where he says, uh, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Gird up your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind and have the Word of God at the forefront of your thinking. He says, you are, you are not redeemed with corruptible things. In other words, you have been redeemed from the empty, bitter, revenge-seeking talk that you learned when you were without Christ. When you were without Christ, you spoke whatever was in your heart that came out of your carnal nature. But you've been redeemed, verse 18 says, not with corruptible things, it's with the blood of Jesus. You've been redeemed, you've been set free from empty, bitter conversation, revenge-seeking motives that you received by tradition from your fathers. Chapter 4, verse 11, Peter says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, let him speak what God has spoken. Let that be what's in his heart. Let that be the truth upon which his or her life and defense is founded. And secondly, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Peter says, Lay aside all wrong attitudes of heart, out of which come evil speakings. Wherefore, he says in verse 1, chapter 2, Laying aside all malice and all guile. Now, guile is the attempt to be nice, but you don't really mean what you're saying. That's what guile is. It's, guile is like, it's, it's wonderful to see you today. And it's not. That's guile. That's, that's a beautiful example of guile. Guile is fraud, is, 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 is verbal fraud. Lay aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies and envies, and all evil speakings. And as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, Peter is saying that you, you have seen that God is good and was good to you even when you were thankless and unholy. But let that be your goal. He is good to the evil and to the just and to the unjust. Let that be your goal to represent him in your generation. Peter goes on to say in verse 9, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, an unusual people. 
that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but you are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, he says in verse 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by good works, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, when you first read that, you say, now, what, what, what purpose would a, an unsaved Gentile have to glorify God because I have had a good conversation? Well, the context of that verse is that before the visitation of God comes, before the day of the Lord, because they did behold Christ in you, they turned from their sin and turned to God. And on the day of judgment, they will glorify God because they saw Christ in you. They heard Christ in you. Folks, even some of the most wicked out there, they're sick of their wickedness. They're tired of it themselves. They hate the backbiting as much as anybody else does. But they don't know how to get out. It's become a way of life. It's a vain tradition that's been passed on to them. The only chain breaker is Jesus Christ. The only one can set them free is Christ. And the only ambassador for Christ in your workplace is you or your neighborhood, wherever it happens to be where the speaking against you is happening, you are the only ambassador for Jesus Christ. Christ says, settle the issue now. The rewards that I'm giving you are not necessarily in this life. I have prepared for you an eternal reward. Let your focus be there and let me be your strength in your circumstance. You are a royal priesthood. Show forth praises out of your mouth. Let them curse, but you bless. Let them lie, you speak the truth. Let them hate you. Love. Love your enemies. Love your enemies, Jesus said. Do good to them that hate you. And lastly, in chapter 3, verse 8, finally he said, Be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, and love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. In other words, Peter's saying, Don't take it personally. Think of where these people are headed, folks. They don't have the upper hand on you. You're going to heaven. You're saved. Your name's in the Lamb's book of life. You have an eternal destiny with God. They don't have the upper hand on you. Have pity on them. In their momentary triumph, like Pilate, who had Jesus before him, said, Don't you know I have the power? And Jesus said, You have no power over me unless it was given you from above. Momentary, elusive triumph. That's all it is. Have pity on them. Because without Christ, they're going to a sinner's hell. Without Christ, they're going to suffer the wrath of God for all of eternity. Don't take it personally. Not rendering, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. That means evil speaking or, or nauseous talk for nauseous talk, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that you are there, to un, there unto call that you should inherit a blessing. Jesus is saying through Peter, bless them because I've called you to a blessing. I've called you to something much beyond what you're experiencing right now. So bless them in the event that they may turn and receive me as Savior. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. In verse 13, he says an incredible thing. He says, and who is it that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? What harm will come to you? Remember Jesus said to his disciples, not a hair on your head will perish. Folks, some of those he spoke to lost their heads. He wasn't talking about their physical body. He said, I'm doing something that's eternal. And when you received me into your heart, you were grafted into an eternal kingdom and not a hair of that's going to perish. Nobody can touch that because it's been born of God. Who will harm you if you are followers of that which is good? But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, verse 14 again, happy are ye, and, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, verse 15, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always 
Some of the people who will come against you the hardest. I had a, I had a, a boss one time in the police department that was demon possessed. I, I don't even say that lightly. The man would look at me, his eyes would bug out, his head would, his face would get red and he would have killed me if he could have on the spot. He did everything in his power to discredit me. Asking people about my conversation, threatening me that if I ever spoke the name of Jesus in a public meeting again, that he would have me uh, court-martialed or something like that. And all these other things, calling places that I was supposed to be at appointments to find out from the people, the general public, what time I arrived, what time I left to see if my own records matched the records there. Incredible, the insane pursuit of me that came into the heart of this man. But I want to tell you something, folks. When I left the police force, he went to church. Can you believe? He went to a, a Bible-believing church. What he could not triumph over, triumphed over him. Hallelujah. I remember he called me into his office one day to threaten me, telling me my career was finished, telling me he, every time he called me, and half, well, not every time, but a lot of times he threatened me, and, he'd, and then one time he said, what do you think about this? He was very arrogant. He was an Englishman, an extremely an arrogant man. Uh, I'm not, please don't miss it, I'm not. <laughs> Some folks can be a little arrogant from, and I remember, I'm really digging a hole here, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> not everybody, obviously, but some. And I looked at him. He said, what do you think of all this? And he was threatening me and talking about the demise of my so-called career that he, in his estimation, I didn't have anyway. And I looked at him and I said, you need God in your life. And he said, why do you say that? I said, well, look at you. I said, you have no control over yourself. I said, the Bible says a man without control over his spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls. And then he opened up and he began to share his life with me. He began to share a failed marriage and just a failed a sense of personal failure. He began just to open his heart and speak to me. And then he, after several minutes, he realized what he had done and then sort of drew back into his defensive position again. But I saw something in that man. There was a hunger, and he was, he was fighting against Christ like the Apostle Paul did. I don't know where he's at today, but I do know he went to a Bible-believing church. He and his wife both began to attend, and I thank God for that. Now, lastly, commit yourself into the care of God. Let's close with this now. Chapter 2. Verse 21, for even hereunto you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, and neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Commit yourself into the care of of God because Christ left us an example when he was reviled he reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously chapter 4 verse 19 if you'll go there with me wherefore Peter says let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator Chapter 1, my last scripture. And this says it all. Verse 3. <clears throat> Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. Folks, there will be no corruption there in heaven. There will be no lies. There will be no backbiters. There will be no guile incorruptible and undefiled hallelujah there be nothing that makes a lie and that fades not away he has begotten us through jesus christ into this inheritance that's incorruptible now this is all christ undefiled fades not away and reserved in heaven for you hallelujah who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So that means trials. That the trial of your faith, 
being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Verse 5 says it all, who are kept by the power of God through faith. That's how we're kept. That's how we get through the fire. We are kept by the power of God. The power is not within ourselves to love unconditionally. The power is not within ourselves to refrain from evil speaking. The power is the power that God gives us through the Holy Ghost. The Word of God shows us what we must be and that the Holy Ghost comes and gives us the power to be what God has called us to be. And we lay hold of it all through faith in what God has said He will do. We are kept by the power of God through faith. And that's got to be the scripture I leave you with because I know some of you are leaving this sanctuary today and you're going back into very difficult situations. But you will be kept by the power of God. If you believe and you trust, there will be a sovereign presence of God if you will stop lashing out and stop trying to defend yourself. You will experience a sovereign presence of God come upon your life, a peace that the Bible says passes understanding. There's no apparent reason for it. To anybody outside the kingdom of God can't understand why you can just sit there so calmly when people are lying about you and slandering you and doing everything in their power to discredit you and yet you seem unmoved. The joy of the Lord is still there. You're still able to smile. You're still able to love. You're still able to speak kind words of blessing because the power of God is on your life. The power of God. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead has come and quickened your mortal body and given you that resurrection life that Jesus won for you on Calvary. You are appropriating it. You are laying hold of it, folks. We have to, we have to allow God to make this gospel a reality in everyday living can't be just something we shout about on Sunday. It's got to carry through Monday to Saturday in the workplace. We have to turn to God and say, God, make this a reality. And God will do exactly what you ask him to do. And next Sunday, you will come into the house of God and you will have a shout of joy because he has kept you. He has kept you. You have not been triumphed over. By any power of darkness, no wicked tongue has come against you. Every tongue, God said, that rises against my people. You shall condemn it. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. You shall declare that it has no power over you because all power in heaven and earth is given to Jesus Christ and he gives it to whomsoever he will. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable mercy and grace that he gives us the strength to be what we cannot be and raises us up to do what we could never do in our own strength and causes us to be what we could never be apart from him. That's called a testimony. It's a testimony. Walking in the power of God. Would you stand, please? Hallelujah.